Hello, everyone, and welcome to Science Division Live. My name is Jose Zuniga. I am one of the science educators here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I will be your virtual host today. It is my very distinct pleasure to introduce you to Marlo Wiley Brillen, Brillen excuse me, uh, who is our expert today, who will be talking to us about Haida tattooing. And after this presentation, we will be hopefully having a discussion. So if you have questions or comments you'd like to share, you can share those in the comment sections of the videos. I'll be monitoring those and we'll get to those after the presentation. Without further ado, Marlo, please take it away. Hi, as you said, uh, I'm Marlo Wiley Brillen. I am um, Cree from Lesser Slave Lake, Alberta on both my parents' sides. And I'm also Skidigit Haida from the Lanitsadis Eagle Clan on my mother's side. Um, I grew up on the traditional territory of the Comox First Nations, which is on Vancouver Island in BC. Um, I'm just finishing up my BA in anthropology. So I'm just working here at the Denver Museum as an intern, this the Native American intern. So um, yeah, so I'm just, my presentation today is about Haida tattooing and the functions that Haida tattooing served in society and also um, the impacts of colonization. So I'm gonna go right in and I created a video that I will share. These two photos span the 11 years in the Haida village of Skidigit, where my family originates from. As you look at this picture, you may wonder what happened between the years of 1884 and 1895. The Canadian government implemented regulations under what we, to this day, continue to be governed under, called the Indian Act. The Indian Act included a ban of all Indigenous ceremonies and cultural traditions. On the West Coast, this meant our potlatch ceremonies were banned for 67 years. If you are unfamiliar with what a potlatch is, it is a ceremony practiced on the Northwest Coast of Canada among many nations where people share their cultural property through song, dance, and all manner of family business was conducted, which included naming ceremonies, adoptions, marriages, showing family connections, passing of leadership, and honoring the dead. The potlatch was one of, the, one of the most integral components of our traditional economy. Chiefs would spend years accumulating their wealth in order to give away every last thing in order to show his rank. The more you give, the higher your rank. But giving to other chiefs was actually more of a loan. Chiefs were expected to return these loans of interest, meaning giving more goods at their own potlatch. This redistribution of wealth was the lifeblood of our traditional economy. You can now begin to imagine how the potlatch ban severely impacted nearly all aspects of Indigenous way of life on the Northwest Coast. During this time under the potlatch ban, our cultural objects were stolen, confiscated for breaking the law, and sold to collectors around the world, which fill the museums today. Where is Haida Gwaii? I'm presenting from the little red dot in Denver, and the arrow is pointed to Haida Gwaii, which is an island off of British Columbia and Canada. The Haida Territory is a chain of islands, including some territory in Alaska. A brief overview of the structure of Haida society. The Haida people have two moieties, distinguished by two main crests, which are the Eagle and the Raven Clan. As Haida culture is matrilineal, you are born into the clan from your mother's side. All cultural rights and prerogatives, such as family crests, are inherited through your mother. So jumping into the tattooing talk now. Traditionally, acquiring tattoos in Haida culture is only done to commemorate the family hosting a potlatch. The chiefs and matriarchs of the family would decide who and what crests will be tattooed amongst their family. The tattooing would be held before the potlatch or during, where songs and ceremony were conducted to honor the recipients of the tattoos and also bragging rights. There were specific dances specifically for showing off the completed tattoos. Having tattoos was a sign of prestige and nobility due to the association of hosting a potlatch. Having many tattoos reflected how many times a family had potlatch, which is directly related to the status within the tribe. In Haida culture, one of the most important ways to uplift your children is to give them rank and status 
by pot latching and the ability to prove your stature from the commemorative tattoos they wore. The placement of tattoos are mainly in the front of the body and the placement varies based on men and women. Typically tattoos are placed symmetrically on the body, left and right forearm or left and right thigh and so on. Sometimes they were the same design or they were similar in shape, though different crests. Tattooing has been a practice amongst the Haida for thousands of years, which was greatly affected by colonization and the potlatch fetch ban. The first to arrive in Haida Gwaii were the Spanish in 1774, while the first trade happened amongst the British in 1787. Silver became introduced and traded amongst the Haida, and as the potlatch ban was enforced, people were unable to earn their tattoos. On top of the potlatch ban, tattoos were viewed as disdainful by Christian missionaries and Haida people eventually wore clothing to cover their tattoos, and the practice was dormant for over 100 years. Haidas began engraving their crests onto bracelets, which became an alternative way to show one's lineage and family. Bracelets were easily removable, which was important because wearing any regalia during the potlatch band was illegal. They were a convert way of being able to show your crests and rank easily hidden when missionaries and Indian agents were around. Bracelets became an important part of Haida culture. It became a symbol of rank and status similar to tattoos. I thought this topic was appropriate because at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science in the Northwest Coast Collection, there is an engraved Haida bracelet. This bracelet is possibly depicting a sea bear, which is a crest amongst the Haida people. Bracelets and other jewelry are still a very important part of Indigenous culture and fashion. I would like to acknowledge the two Haida handpoke tattoo artists that have provided these beautiful photos of their tattoos, Kuiawa Jones and Corey Bullpit. It is very important to acknowledge and honor the indigenous artists that continue to practice our art forms and our culture. Because Northwest Coast art, specifically Haida, is a very desired art form, we have many people who are non-indigenous doing Haida style tattoos and art that profit from our culture. So when you're looking into Haida or other indigenous tattoos and art forms, please do some research and make sure the person is indigenous to the nation they claim. Within the past several years, there has been a revitalization of traditional Haida handpoke tattooing. The revitalization of Haida tattooing practices is such a special and incredible event that has been an experience where Haidas can represent their families, lineages, culture, and their specific crests. The revitalization of, of this practice has also given Haida's pride to honor who they are, where they come from, and demonstrating the resurgence and the resilience of our people. So that's the end of the video. That was very illuminating. Thank you for sharing that with us. I did not, I did not realize that you know the uh, the adaptability of the people to to transfer these crests onto bracelets to continue to hold on to their traditions even when they are being actively suppressed. I think shows the dynamic nature of culture and how cultures are living, changing, breathing things. They are not ever static. They don't ever just stay one way. And so I have a question for you. And if you out there have questions for Marlo, please post them in the comments. We would love to hear from you. But my question for you, Marlo, is with the resurgence of these tattoos, and you had commented how people will seek out Haida art for tattoos as well. Uh, what is your hope for the rebirth of this tradition? How would you personally like to see it continue? Well, um, I, <laughs> that's a great question. I. Uh... Well, there has been more and more, um, even other indigenous tribes that have started doing um, more hand poke tattooing within their own cultures as well. But um, for the um, Haida practice, there's um, a, a couple Haida artists, like I mentioned, Kuiawa Jones and Corey Bullpit, who are some of the main Haida uh, hand poke tattoo artists. But um, with the 
sorry, what was the other part of the question? Sorry. What's your hope for this tradition moving forward into the future? Just that Haida's can gain some claim over our own art forms and um, because it was specific to Haida people, like this, the extensiveness of the tattooing practice. Um, other tribes were also um, tattooed, but not to the extensiveness of Haida people. Mm -hmm. um, though, but I think with the awareness of Haida, like authentic Haida art, hopefully people start to do more research and actually see if the person's Haida, because as I said in the presentation, there's a lot of people appropriating our art forms to make money and it's not appropriate and it's our culture and um, it's special to us, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it's interesting to think about the fact that you had mentioned how tattoos were considered to be improper by the Westerners who encountered the Haida people. And there is still a tendency today to associate tattoos with a certain uh, like unprofessional, like you can't have exposed tattoos at work in a lot of places and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to see protections or like cultural protections for cultural tattoos of this nature uh, built into like law or, or at least organizational policy? You mean so people could have their traditional tattoos in a workplace? Yes. I, I totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like no doubt and it's it's yeah it's something we can wear with us all the time to represent who we are it's not just you know regalia that we can put on our button blankets or wear a hat all day it's like something that's permanently on us saying who we are and where we come from so I think that's really important um, one of the things I've encountered in my experiences here living in Colorado and spending a lot of my childhood in the Southwest, particularly in New Mexico, uh, there are a lot of places where, you know, you have like the art gallery and they have like the Navajo goddesses and some stylized painting that's going to go back and decorate somebody's condo. And, you know, I, I don't know if it is similar. I would imagine it's similar in the Pacific Northwest to have Northwest uh, indigenous people's art be incorporated into marketing, be incorporated into uh, you know, tourism uh, ads and things mm -hmm. like that, and be incorporated into you know, those types of little kitschy keychain things you bring home. Um, if our visitors find themselves in a situation where they are wandering into one of these uh, art galleries, what advice would you have for them to really distinguish between what is respectful and authentic and what is being appropriated? Um, there has been many uh, cases where people claim false nations and fake indigeneity and go under like false names even to like protect their identity. And they have like a middleman who ends up um, doing the selling because they don't want them to know who they are. So, but the, I think the key word is inspired by, or like that you can't like inspired by means that they're non-Indigenous and like they just really love the art form. And, and another wording uh, I would look out for is like lived on the territory. So it's not like, they're not saying they're from there. They sit, they're saying they've lived there. So it's, it's a lot, those two words typically are indicators of those probably non-Indigenous um, oh, relations. Flat, huh? Yeah, <laughs> those are the two, like, watch out for that. <laughs> I will definitely be prepared. Yeah. Um, uh, you're an intern here with us at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. What has been one of the highlights of your internship so far? Well, I'm working specifically with the Northwest Coast Collection, so I get to work with, um, objects that are from my traditional territory of Haida Gwaii. And um, it's just been really amazing to handle objects that are like many of them that um, only recently the objects were put on the website so people can view them. So like some of the objects that people haven't seen before. So it's just awesome because I've had the chance to share it on my social media and get engagement from indigenous artists, indigenous community members and um, you know, and learning a lot because when I post objects and I don't, I'm not super familiar with some of them that, you know, I have people commenting about them and um, sharing stuff with me that I end up, um, 
I'm able to translate translate that to the descriptions in the catalog, which have because a lot of um, the information is um, wrong or inaccurate or just dated. And um, so adding new, fresh experiences of cultural people into the catalog is something really special. I imagine so. I, I, I cannot fathom what it must be like to have the experience to interact with objects from your ancestors in this kind of way. And we have a question in the comments here. What is your favorite object? To eat? Uh, so far that you've interacted with? Um, there is this dragonfly bowl and it's Haida and it's really small and it can fit in your size of your hands. If you want, I could share screen share. I have some photos of it. Yeah, it's just, it's just so small and so intricately, um, intricately carved. And um, here it is. <clears throat> so this is a really tiny bowl. So in the center there, there's um I don't think we can see the big image yet. Oh no? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, better? Uh not no. <laughs> that's okay. Oh, though. zoom chair. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> there. <laughs> is, can you see it now? Still small. <laughs> Weird. You know, computers, they make our lives easier and more complicated all at the same time. Here, I'll stop sharing. But yeah, so it has, it's depicting a dragonfly and typically with the um, Haida culture, you, um, well, the dragonfly has a man in the middle of its um, face. So here, I'll see if I can, oh, there it is. Perfect. Hopefully that works. That right. work? Yeah. Yay. <laughs> so that is it's like small and it just fits in the palm of your hand. It's intricately carved, it's alder. Um, so the little face in the center is a little man and you can see his hands and his little feet there. And um, you'll have to see the back view to get understanding of a dragonfly, but it's one of my favorite objects I've had to work with. What makes it your favorite? I don't know. I think it's because I, I don't encounter much um, intricately carved bowls and especially dragonfly and just how intricately carved it is. I can appreciate that because I myself am, a, am an emerging artist. So I, I work with wood. Yeah. So um, I'm working on carving mainly in 2D and hopefully moving into 3D, but um, it's just inspiring just to see such amazing pieces that are so small. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I, a dual appreciation, scientists and artists, right? For sure, yeah. It, it is very, very beautiful. I, I, I'm I, wondering, what is the significance of the man within the dragonfly? I imagine there's some story, but I, I couldn't tell it because I'm not too familiar with um, that. Um, right. But the dragonfly is one of, um, uh, it's a crest that belongs to one of the families in, in um, Think in the Raven Clan, I could be wrong, but yeah. So potentially also a tattoo, right? Oh yeah, yeah. In one of the last um, slides I've shown, um, there was a dragonfly on one person's wrist. Yeah. Mm, I wonder if this bowl was another attempt to have a crest uh, underneath the noses of those Indian agents. <laughs> Uh, we have a question here from the comments. Have you been surprised by anything you've learned about Haida culture working with the items from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science? Um, I think surprised. Uh, it's more um, things that are mislabeled, I think. Um, um, Haida is very um, distinct and everyone wanted Haida objects and um, not saying they didn't want other objects, but uh, specifically, and it, it's also one of the easier indigenous nations to like say, mm -hmm. compared to New Chalnuth or Kwa mm -hmm. like it's a lot easier to say. And I think a lot of the times um, people mislabeled stuff or wanted to sell their belongings for more money mm -hmm. because they're a Haida that they'd label them as Haida. So I've been going through the catalog and um, flagging things that I don't think are um, Haida or not a certain nation's um, art form mm -hmm. just to, um, get more opinions too from knowledge keepers because um, 
yeah, because it's important to keep the Haida stuff together and actually know what these objects are, are and where they're from. Yeah, I and so we're so fortunate here at DMNS to have your your effort, your work, and your expertise in, in improving our collections. In terms of these collection objects. Uh, this is going to be a little similar to that first question I asked you. It'll be the last question that I ask you. Uh, what is your hope for the Haida objects in the Northwest collection at the museum moving forward? I would love the catalog to be enriched by um, Haida uh, voices and um, having some Haida words in there to what it's used to describe. Um, and know where these objects are from because there are uh, distinctly three areas where Haida's live, like Skidigit, Masset, and there's the little Alaskan Haida's. And if repatriation were to happen down the road, it's really important for these objects to have a place to go yeah. when and if that ends up happening. And so having the most information as possible to get enriched and hopefully end up some of the pieces end up going home. Well, I sincerely hope that as well. I really do. Marlo, thank you so much for spending some time with us today and sharing your expertise. I've really enjoyed it. I, I'm, I'm speaking for all of the people who have tuned in. I'm sure they enjoyed it as well. It was an excellent discussion, very informative presentation. We really appreciate your time. And we appreciate you out there joining us today for Science Division Live. We hope everybody has a good rest of their day today. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.